come here about every six weeks. That seems to be a, a useful period so that I can catch young rabbits and mark them with ear tags and follow their, their subsequent growth and, and uh, when they get uh, Khaleesi virus and uh, what happens to them at that point. Dr. Brian Cook is Mr. Khaleesi virus. Before that, he was Mr. Spanish flea. Arguably, he has done more to rid the continent of European rabbits than just about anybody else. He's an unassuming scientist who has devoted 30 years to the cause. For the past five years, part of his role has included making these regular pilgrimages from his home in Canberra to a study site in the heart of the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. The routine here is pretty much the same every time. With the help of a researcher from the South Australian Plant and Pest Control Commission, Brian puts the traps out on top of known active warrens late in the afternoon. The following morning, they are checked for rabbits. The rabbits themselves are checked for signs of rabbit Khaleesi virus disease. From the blood samples we can look for antibodies in the, in the serum and know whether this rabbit's had uh, RCD or not. They're tagged, weighed... 650 grams. No worries. And no doubt, to their great relief, released. The idea is to keep track of when and where the rabbit Khaleesi virus hits. And what Brian Cook has noticed is that rabbits are now quite difficult to find in these parts. What we've found out at this particular site, which is a fairly typical of much of inland Australia, is that the disease is, is present uh, a good deal of the time. It's, it's present uh, usually um, for uh, probably five out of the eight trips we do a year. And uh, so that it's, it's constantly circulating through the rabbit population. And basically it's, it's, it's affecting such a high proportion of the young rabbits that come into the population through breeding. It kills most of those, so there's, there's almost no recruitment of young rabbits into the breeding population. And, and as a result, the, the older adult population is, is kept at a very low ebb. And, and, uh, and it's been that way now for, for five years. So the population crashed to about 10 or 15% of its original level when the disease first came through and the population has stayed at that level ever since. It's getting towards the sort of result Brian would have hoped for when the rabbit Khaleesi virus disease, or RCD, made its untimely escape from Mordang Island off South Australia's York Peninsula. It was the end of October in 1995 when scientists studying RCD were first alerted to the possibility the disease had skipped the island. Within days, it was seen in several spots around the state. Two dead rabbits found on the mainland were sent to the CSIRO Australian Health Laboratory over the weekend. Tests reveal at least one has been infected by the Khaleesi virus. Over the next few months, it cut a swathe through rabbit populations across southeastern Australia. Half a decade on, it's difficult to remember the hysteria that went with what was both criticised as a scientific bungle and heralded as a saviour by farmers and conservationists. It's the most significant conservation issue the country faces. Um, here is, here is uh, a really important control method that's available to us. Uh, let's maximise its use. Many of the concerns about the virus affecting native animals and rabbits building up immunity to RCD don't seem to have eventuated. Good shot. But rabbit shooters were seriously affected, as were companies which relied on rabbits for their income. Today, employees of Outback Foods prepared to close up shop for good. It's sad, it's a sad day. This... A year after the virus escaped, each state began controlled releases. Run, rabbit, run, rabbit, run, run, run. Today, the virus has found its way into almost every corner of the country. Although Brian Cook admits it hasn't been a success story wherever it's travelled. 
I think you can probably argue that the, the population's been taken down um, much more than half of its original numbers. Um, but but uh, the, the critical point, I suppose, is that it's, it's taken it down to such low numbers in the arid zone that, that it's, it's, it's uh, ecologically significant and, and that we are seeing regeneration. In some of the wetter coastal areas around, particularly in southeastern Australia, and perhaps a little to in southwestern Australia, the, the virus has had far lesser impact than it has in the arid areas. And uh, in many of those places, rapid populations are essentially unchanged. In cool, damp southwest Western Australia, those findings have been backed up with the work of Tony Henson. First of all, we started off with a, a surveillance program which aimed to look at the um, um, performance of the disease in the field, the natural performance in the disease. And um, it was found that following the initial outbreak, it was two and a half years before we got a repeat um, epizootic. And um, this was very unusual in most other study areas in Australia. Um, there were regular outbreaks, um, sometimes two or possibly three outbreaks a year. And um, most of those other study areas were in drier country. And we found that in this uh, wetter part of the southwest of Australia, um, Khaleesi virus or Khaleesi virus outbreaks have occurred very infrequently. Tony and his team have for the past two years been trapping blowflies and bushflies to try to determine how the virus is spread from rabbit to rabbit. It's long been thought the humble fly could have transported the virus off Wardang Island and then transferred it from there on. What is now apparent is that the fly is to blame or to thank but it's not a case of fly to rabbit contact. It's the fly faeces and saliva which do the trick. We've looked at what we see to be the most likely one and that is uh, blowflies feeding on the carcasses of dead rabbits which have died of Khaleesi virus. Um, depositing faeces on pasture plants in the, in the vicinity of the warren or wherever the rabbit has died and, um, and then rabbits uh, ingesting these uh, grass blades and so forth and um, contracting the disease and th this has been found to occur oh, frequently. There's a good few blowflies in there. I think we'll collect them in the morning. This vital finding has been supported by research on the other side of the Nullarbor. We've done a lot of research on the on the flies and we've demonstrated that if you feed a, a blowfly, for example, on uh, the liver of an infected rabbit, the, the, the virus is taken up by the fly and the virus actually persists in the, in the gut of the fly and subsequently it's excreted as fly spots, uh, faeces or, or saliva from the fly. <coughs> the, um, that, those fly spots actually contain quite a bit of virus and there's enough virus in a single fly spot to, to, to kill two or three rabbits. With blowflies much thicker in the hotter, more arid parts of Australia, this information could well explain why the virus does better there. But as they say in the advertisements, that's not all. Scientists have very recently made another extremely significant discovery. The existence of a second Khaleesi virus, particularly prevalent, in cooler, wetter climes. This second virus, which doesn't appear to kill rabbits, could have been around for decades. The s significance of it is that the, uh, it, it looks as though these antibodies produced to this non-pathogenic virus, uh, to some extent, immunise rabbits against the, the more lethal Khaleesi virus that we've, we've introduced. And if that's the case, it, it could explain why the, the virus has a patchy effect in different parts of the country. In inland Australia here, um, there's relatively few rabbits carry these antibodies to this pre-existing virus. But if you go down to the, country, the coastal areas like Bacchus Marsh in Victoria where we work, you'll find that a high proportion of rabbits actually carry these, these other antibodies. And, and on that basis may well be partly protected against the more lethal form of the virus. What 
this means is that with further research, the deadly virus could be strategically released at times when the other virus is at a low ebb in the population. It could be one way of increasing the efficiency of RCD in those high rainfall cool regions. But further research is the problem. Not because Brian Cook wants to slow down. His life work has been dedicated to getting rid of the last rabbit. He was mostly responsible for introducing the Spanish flea back in the 1980s when myxomatosis was losing its potency. Well, I've had a lot of requests from station owners in the northern areas for uh, rabbit fleas to release, but in fact it's pointless in releasing the present strain of flea which comes from England because it simply will not persist in those areas and we really have to find a better strain. And in May this year, Dr Cook won the Eureka Science Prize for his work in locating the Khaleesi virus in Spain and its subsequent release in Australia. Our winner tonight for what may be the single most important contribution over the past five decades to the pastoral industry and to sustainable development of Australia's heartland is Dr Brian Cook. Amazingly, within a week of that announcement, Brian was told by his employer, the CSIRO, that the RCD project would be wound up. I was not, not terribly impressed about that. <laughs> um, I, I think that, that um, not, not simply from my own personal point of view, but, but I think there's so much work still to go on with the Khaleesi virus that, that um, winding, a, winding a project up at a, at a point when um, you know, we're really coming to grips with, with how the Khaleesi virus is working um, is, is, is fairly short-sighted. It, it's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's history repeating itself. When Mixo was released, they thought they'd done the job, and a lot of people tried very hard to make sure that that wouldn't occur uh, after RCD release, and, it, and it's happening. And I think that, that highlights the lack of understanding of the damage that's caused by rabbits. But it's absolutely unbelievable. David Lord is one of those graziers whose property has benefited greatly by the spread of Khaleesi virus. He's in an arid region just south of Broken Hill, and rabbits have always been a huge problem here. To give you some idea, if, um, some idea we've got 26,000 warrens on the place, uh, we did have. Um, the number of rabbits living in them could vary between probably f oh, 10 in a drought to probably 50 or 60 in a good time and a rabbit eats about 250 grams of dry matter per day, so if you do your sums on that, your total tonnage of loss of vegetation per day is absolutely huge. We first visited David in August 1995, just two months before RCD swept through his sheep property, Thakaringa. Yeah, there's plenty of activity here. As you can see, they're cleaning the burrows out, they're breeding again, there's fur on the ground. Um, very, very active burrows here. In August 1996, Landline returned. It was a very different story. Well, here we are a year later, David. Since then, the RCD, Rabbit Khaleesi virus, has gone through your property. Now, this is an active warren. Has RCD worked? Absolutely, yes. Um, there's up to five, you know, we've seen five rabbits here. Uh, there would be between 30 and 50 otherwise. Last month, we went back to that same warren. David, we're back at the same warren four years later, so it's five years since yeah. RCD went through your property. Yep. What are we seeing here? We're seeing the warren vegetating over with this copper burr, which is pretty typical of, of around the property. Um, there is evidence uh, of the odd rabbit here, and strangely enough, there's a dead one here. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. How many dead rabbits do you see these days? Well, percentage of dead rabbits to live ones is far higher than it used to be, um, but we don't see very many rabbits at all. It's, it's an event to see a rabbit these days. I would say in the last three months, I wouldn't have seen 10 rabbits. Despite the worst drought in his lifetime, David has over the past few years seen an impressive regrowth in native vegetation, including perennials like bluebush and saltbush. There'll be a bit of difference since you were here last, Brian. Two years ago, David Lord set up three one-hectare sites, one which excluded all grazers, one that allowed only rabbits in, 
and a control that was open to all grazers. What he found was that only in the enclosure, which allowed no rabbits, were the native Acacia carnii suckers able to survive. Even post-RCD, when there are very few rabbits around, they chewed off the tiny suckers before they had a chance to grow. We originally believed that if we could get rabbits down to about one rabbit to the hectare, well, we'd get quite good regeneration through these areas, but we obviously need to take rabbits down a bit lower than this level. One way of doing that is by ripping warrens. David Lord, though, has been told there is no government money for his ripping program. It's irresponsible of Australia as a nation to um, to expect that the rural community of the day to bear the whole brunt of rabbit, rabbit control because we obviously don't have the resources to do it and we might miss an opportunity with uh, the opportunity being offered us with RCD and myxomatosis. We've made a lot of progress but there is still a lot of areas that we need to tackle. Dr um, Brian Cook has been given a second chance. Last month, a group called the Foundation for a Rabbit-Free Australia announced at its AGM that it had sought funding from Meat and Livestock Australia, the Walmart Company and the Kidman Pastoral Company, and it had been successful. Seeing these other groups pitch in, the CSIRO has also reversed its decision to can the project. So the CSIRO has basically done a backflip on Brian's funding. I wouldn't like to describe it as a backflip. I think that what CSRO has done is to reassess the importance of the work given the fact that there are other organisations that are prepared to provide some sort of financial contribution to assist what CSRO has been involved with for some several years. Brian Cook will now further investigate the pre-existing virus He's also aware of trials in Spain on a genetically engineered myxoma virus which immunised rabbits against both myxomatosis and rabbit calici virus. That could seriously threaten the Australian program. Brian's colleagues in rabbit research have not been so lucky though in their quest for funds. Unfortunately at this stage um, my position sort of ends um, come February next year um, due to lack of uh, ongoing funds. So unfortunately it's not a very bright future. Yeah. And by the new year, Tony Henson in Western Australia will also be looking for a new job. I think so far it, it has been a success and it was heading in the right direction. Um, it's unfortunate that the decision has been made at this stage to, to curtail the funding because we were getting some very promising results and I think um, with a bit more effort we could have got there. But as it is, it appears that we're we're going to go down the same road that we went when myxomatosis came in. We failed to take full advantage of it after, it after it caused the initial reduction. In the Flinders Ranges, a generation of new native pines is blanketing the hillsides. It's the first time since rabbits were introduced that these trees have had a chance. But such positive signs, says Dr Brian Cook, should not be interpreted as having the job of rabbit reduction under control. There are still many unanswered questions. If we leave them unanswered, next time we try to introduce a biological control, people will say, well, they didn't, you know, they didn't really understand what they were doing last time. You know, why should we trust them this time? I think that we, we really owe it to, to everybody to, to make sure that we've um, completed this project as thoroughly as possible.